Morning, I'm uh, Gavin Giovanoni. I'm presenting a concept about flipping the pyramid and treating beyond that uh, as a treatment strategy in multiple sclerosis. And I'd like to thank the Scientific Organizing Committee of ECTRANS for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. I have a large number of disclosures, many of them which will be relevant to my uh, talk today. The risk benefits, um, the gambler's dilemma. We always discuss uh, the benefits and risks of therapy when we uh, talk about treatment strategies in multiple sclerosis. And we often ignore to include the risks of untreated multiple sclerosis. And I just want to remind you that MS is a devastating disease, particularly uh, in the, in the pre-DMT era. We know that the majority of patients develop cognitive impairment that had reduced uh, life expectancy <clears throat> uh, with about 50% of people with multiple sclerosis being unemployed at very low levels of disability of EDSS3. The disease impacted on uh, interpersonal relationships, uh, not to mention the economic burden uh, to society and individual. So we mustn't forget this, that MS is a devastating disease and to uh, improve outcomes, we need to uh, treat this disease very effectively. Now, the big question is who will be the DMT responders? And this is the gambler's dilemma. Nobody goes to a casino to lose money that everybody expects to win. So when you put up 100 people like that and ask who's going to be the responders and non-responders, we don't really know. And what you have to do is put, say, 100 people on uh, therapy. And here we have 100 people on what I call uh, tier one, uh, moderate, moderately efficacious, efficacious, efficacious therapies. And you'll see that after about three to four years, the majority of these people will have breakthrough activity either subclinically in yellow which is minimal evident inflammatory activity, or red clinically with relapses. So what you're doing is you're putting the majority of people at risk of failure to find a minority uh, of responders. When you move up to the next tier, um, so this would be, for example, the orals, um, you, you may improve that uh, ratio, but again, the majority of people will fail uh, to find a minority of what I would call responders or even super responders. However, when you flip the pyramid and go to the most effective therapy uh, first line and you re-baseline people after six months and start the clock ticking again, you will see that about 80% of people will be free of uh, disease activity. So when you go to the top tier of therapies, <clears throat> the majority will be responders with only a few uh, or minority breakthrough in terms of inflammatory activity. And so the question you need to ask yourself is you had MS you know, and you want to roll the dice, uh, where, where would you want to be in the top tier or the bottom tier? And this is the question because um, the recent evidence out of ever, uh, MS Base and other databases suggest you spend about 4.1 years on each tier. So if you do have uh, quite active MS and you need the top tier of treatment, it will take you, you know, at least eight or even longer in terms of years to get to the top tier. So treatment strategies is when you roll the ball or the dice, you have to decide which tier you want to go on to. And this picture yeah, captures all those uh, concepts. Now, we don't use conventional step care. I hope nobody uses conventional step care. This is just clinical monitoring with watchful waiting and slow escalation and often horizontal switching. Most of us now use either rapid escalation or flipping the pyramid. And rapid escalation means we monitor actively using MRI, usually six or 12 monthly, and any breakthrough activity, be it clinical or subclinical, warrants an escalation. Or we go straight to the top and we uh, shift. Now. The, uh, I know that we are constrained by our payers uh, and the licensing authorities, and uh, most of our therapies are licensed according to a level of MS disease activity. Um, but these are all probably factors that need to be considered within an individual healthcare system. Uh, and then on the bottom uh, of this curve, we'll see the prognostic profiling, where we put individual factors into taking individual factors into consideration. In other words, how bad the patient's MS is their risk aversion, family planning, and other factors that may be relevant to a specific patient. <clears throat> now, the evidence is overwhelming, and this is the um, concept we put forward many years ago about how, qu how quickly we intervene. Um, we will change the natural history of this disease, and we're doing it. So this is data from North Italy and Brescia, just showing you that uh, uh, in the pre-DMT era, uh, pe uh, people about 80% of people reached the age of 65 needing a, a, a walking stick. We went into the injectable low efficacy DMT era that dropped to about 65%. And now in the high efficacy era, this is way below that and probably in the region of 20 to 30%.
So clearly we are changing the natural history of the disease by <clears throat> moving up to more of efficacious therapies. Now, not caught in this curve is the <clears throat> uh, time to initiation or diagnosis. And this is now data from Sweden just showing that if you do go on to uh, DMTs within a year of symptom onset, this is time to EDSS4, which is a surrogate for secondary progressive disease. You do much better than if you have delayed access uh, to DMTs. And more recently from MS Space, just shows you the difference between late or early access to high efficacy therapies. You can see um, uh, people who are late access do much, much worse. And obviously in the bottom uh, couple of Maya, you can see the daylight between these curves disappears when you have um, delayed access from six years after disease onset. So I think the message overall is the quicker you get on to a therapy, the better you do. And the quicker you get on to high efficacy therapies, the better you do. And this brings us to this concept of evolving the treatment target away from just no evident inflammatory disease activity. And in the past, we were happy to just reduce relapses. Now we want people to be free of activity. And some of us want to go beyond that and protect the end organ and, stop and normalize brain volume loss and normalize other biomarkers of MS activity. In addition to this, we are also um, thinking about how can we uh, improve overall outcomes by focusing on brain health. Uh, and some of us are beginning to think about doing clinical trials of diseases that restore function, i.e. Uh, disability improvement. Now, the big integrator of damage over, over years is brain volume loss. And we know that brain volume loss occurs uh, at a rate of about two to seven times greater in people with multiple sclerosis. And this reduces biological reserve. And so people with Excessive brain volume loss will reach uh, old age with less brain and spinal cord to protect them from aging. And they are, there is a, a clearly a ladder in terms of efficacy. And so at the top of our pile are drugs like alemtuzumab. And you can see the consequences of a two-year delay in accessing uh, alemtuzumab um, is quite substantial. <clears throat> but I think we also want to point out that it's not only about the therapy, but also age, and you can see uh, the brain volume loss in those patients um, that get onto treatment very early is really within the normal range compared to people who are older who get onto therapy. So there is an interaction with age. Um, I must point out that the brain volume loss in people treated with alemtuzumab uh, in the in the care MS studies um, uh, ranges from around point, uh, zero 0.05 to about point one five per annum, which is in the range that you'd expect for age. <clears throat> Similarly, this is the Canadian uh, uh, ablative HSET program. Apart from the early hit from the neurotoxicity of the ablative chemotherapy program, you can see brain volume loss uh, in the subsequent years is almost normalized in this uh, treated population. So this is something we need to aspire to, to the most effective therapies, uh, i.e. alemtuzumab and HSET, in terms of normalizing brain volume loss and, and giving patients the best volumes uh, for old age. So it's not, not only about MS therapies, uh, what we do, we're trying to build this pyramid on the left, going from anti-inflammatory uh, with add-on neuroprotection, remyelination, neurostration, but there's also a whole uh, focus now on uh, anti-aging or brain health targets, which uh, on, on their own may not seem significant, but if you add them all up, it clearly will improve outcomes. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to shift the uh, curve uh, from people with poor prognosis uh, and try and get our patients to a normal uh, old age so they can age normally. To do this, we need policy. So about uh, seven years ago, we launched a policy initiative to try and uh, change the way we manage MS uh, and learn lessons from stroke, really, to move from a passive to an active. And we put out an MS brain uh, health a policy document where our aim was to encourage the widespread adoption of a therapeutic strategy to maximize lifelong brain health of every person with multiple sclerosis. This is a very simple uh, algorithm to follow. It's all about how we uh, try and improve each part of the pathway uh, with rapid, rapid access uh, to diagnostic tests, uh, rapid access to disease modifying therapy, monitoring and early escalation. And we've put in place a whole lot of follow-on activities to try and drive adoption of this. And I'll please urge you to visit the website and uh, register as a brain health champion. So to conclude then, I'd just like to finish with a story. My father presented at uh, late 30s with chronic renal failure, and he had uh, end-stage kidney disease when he presented. However, he did have intimate episodes of hematuria when he was a teenager that his general uh, or family doctor ignored. 
So he did have a sentinel event, but by the time he got to the uh, nephrologist, it was too late to protect his kidney. And the nephrologist said, well, what can I do for you now? I, you know, I would have liked to have started managing you 20 years ago. And that's the message. Similarly, we don't have the, uh, the advantage of replacing the brain and spinal cord like rheumatologists do with joints. And to be honest with you, they've taught us how to manage MS more aggressively. They've taught us how to flip the pyramid and we should learn these lessons. <clears throat> So in conclusion then, question to yourself, are you prepared to gamble with your patient's brain and, uh, brains and spinal cords? Um, uh, I agree that prognostic profiling should be included in your decision making, okay, and we should have shared or guided decision making to improve outcomes. I think we need to go beyond uh, no inflammatory disease activity and try and normalize brain volume loss, and we need to have a holistic management of MS, also target all those non-MS uh, things that, make, that improve outcomes. And I just want to say that we are in a privileged position as MS neurologists because um, um, central events, re uh, um, we have a central event, in other words, patients with MS present quite early and we have the time to protect the brain and spinal cord. And the only way, the only way of doing this at a population level is by adopting the flipping the pyramid strategy. And I'd just like to thank you and just point out this is a picture of our team and uh, these are all the campaigns we're in. Thank you.